Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for animals. On this episode, from factory farms to laboratories, the biggest cases from PETA's Cruelty Investigations Department. There was no food at the facility. There was a rotten head of lettuce. There were reptiles, meaning snakes and turtles and lizards. There were scorpions and spiders and sloths and hamsters and hedgehogs and chinchillas. I mean, he just dealt in anything and everything that he could make a penny on with just absolutely no decency whatsoever. PETA's Senior Vice President of Cruelty Investigations, Dafna Nekminovich, describing one of the biggest cases ever where 27,000 animals were seized at the now-defunct U.S. Global Exotics in Texas. It's just one of the many cases that she recalls in her time leading the fight against everything from animal supply houses to factory farms that sell your food. One case with Hormel in 2008 was especially heinous. There were descriptions by workers of workers penetrating sows with crowbars and things like that. Totally appalling. I mean, the entire operation is something out of a horror movie. I mean, you've got, you know, when we say factory farm, we don't mean, you know, a dozen or a hundred pigs. It's a, it's a massive, massive warehouse that contains 6,000 plus pigs. Um, and, you, you know, I mean, it's just, it is literally a factory farm. And these animals are seen as nothing but uh, meat production. More with Daphna, but first, I just want to thank you again for being part of our listening audience on the PETA podcast and for the opportunity to do some good for the animals 24 7 via these programs on the internet. To help us out, please go to the podcast player with the PETA rabbit, and on the notes, you'll find a brief survey. Please fill it out. It'll help us grow the podcast. You can also send a link of the show to your friends and let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. And if you've missed any of our shows, catch up and binge listen, including episode one, My Conversation, with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk. What does Ingrid think about no-kill shelters? Well, you can find out on the PETA podcast. Check out the links on the podcast player or on PETA.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also in the midst of the horse racing season with uh, the Kentucky Derby coming up. Listen to how PETA is working to end animal abuse in that so-called sport. Check out all our previous episodes. And if you're on an Apple device, please rate and review. It lets Apple know you care about the issues we talk about on the PETA podcast. Of course, the victories are always so, so sweet for the animals who are liberated from these hell holes. From a, you know, personally, when you have to fight for something so hard and you know it's the right thing and you've been up, you know, night after night strategizing and devising and cajoling authorities and offering help and fundraising to offer resources, the, the victory is so meaningful because it's, it, it, it's really just, it's justice. Shutting down labs, saving animals is hard work. But for Daphne Nekminovich, Senior VP and Head of PETA's Cruelty Investigations, it's worth it when you're able to stop people in the act of abusing animals. And surely PETA doesn't do it alone. In my conversation, Daphne talks about her work and how whistleblowers have been behind some of the biggest cases in PETA history. From the U.S. Global Exotics case in Texas to the Global Captive Breeders case in Southern California to the big Hormel factory farm case in Iowa. My conversation with Daphna on how PETA is fearless when it comes to protecting the animals. We go after anyone who abuses animals, whether they are an individual or a corporation. Uh, the Cruelty mm. Investigations Department includes not just our hands-on division, our field division, but also our undercover eyewitness investigations, which focus on anyone uh, who abuses animals, whether it is a circus, uh, a blood bank using discarded racing greyhounds, as we recently exposed, a laboratory, a puppy mill, 
a factory farm or a slaughterhouse. Uh, we respond to tips from whistleblowers, and we do our best to expose conditions for animals so that consumers make the most compassionate, humane decisions when they make their daily choices. Yeah, you know, when I think of cruelty investigations, it's to me, it, because of my background, it's it almost seems like a, a combination of, you know, Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein and Perry Mason and a little bit of investigative journalism. But it really is, uh, I mean, you do very detailed investigations. We do. We do detailed investigations um, that are big scale. And also we do detailed investigations when it comes to our hands-on work in the field. If a dog has starved to death or a dog is being neglected or a cat or any other animal. And you depend on whistleblowers or do you have people actually going out there and and trying to, uh, you know, uh, find out or ferret out the, you know, these, uh, you know, malfeasance wherever you find it or primarily whistleblowers? We, we don't depend on whistleblowers, but we most definitely take whistleblower calls and do our best to respond to them. Some of our uh, investigations have been, have, were born, if you, if so to speak, thanks to whistleblowers. As an example, the recent uh, pet blood bank in Cherokee, Texas, which we exposed and eventually shut down. Our complainant was a whistleblower, and the documentation that we shared with the public came from him. Uh, and and some of our other undercover investigations over the years were also based on whistleblower tips, but we don't depend ex- exclusively on whistleblowers. Occasionally, we, uh, you know, we happen upon a, a facility, if you will, or we know, for example, uh, with a, a, another recent investigation that we published, BioCorp in uh, Minnesota. We know that we would like to educate the public with new information, more recent information about dissection, where the animals who are dissected in schools come from, what uh, what happens to them before they make it to the schools. And so we did some research on suppliers of this of, of animals for dissection and found this BioCorp corporation where we went in and not just found the the dead animals that they were, uh, you know, injecting with formalin and things like this before shipping them to schools. But we were also able to expose that pigeons were drowned in a meth- in an attempt to kill them, which is a horrible, cruel way to die. That crayfish were injected with latex dye as a method of killing, which is obviously cruel. And our position, of course, is that those things are illegal. And the turtles were being frozen alive, which is not just cruel with any animal, reptiles as well, and especially, but that they were then waking up and being refrozen. And so we have gone to authorities on that. And that was not a whistleblower investigation. So it all depends, you know, on, on, on where the information comes from. And without PETA stepping in in that BioCorp uh, situation in Minnesota, uh, I mean, what's it, what is the status here? Did, did, was PETA able to shut down that? that facility? Not yet, but we it's currently under criminal investigation. Uh, we did go to court in order to, we follow, we had to follow uh, some unique process in Minnesota, go in front of a judge who then ordered police to investigate, and the investigation remains open. Your investigations aren't just national, they're international and, you know, worldwide. And let's talk about, I guess, a uh, I guess you could call them some of your greatest hits. I mean, one of the high profile cases involved the U.S. Global Exotics uh, Company in Texas and 27,000 animals were involved, uh, confiscated from this international exotic animal dealer. Uh, tell me about that case. And, and that was something you were able to shut down. That was something. Thankfully, we were able to shut down. And that was actually a whistleblower case. The whistleblowers were, um, was some, someone who had visited or worked at the facility. But this was a facility involved in the international exotic pet trade, and it traded in animals as small as spiders and scorpions to animals as large as sloths and wallabies and kinkajous, kodimundis, and other exotic mammals who were wild-caught and then shipped to this 
hideous facility and oftentimes not even unpacked but kept in those containers that they arrived in and then shipped elsewhere. Uh, the man who ran this facility, his name is Jason Shaw, and he was originally from New Zealand. And he he just had absolutely zero regard for the animals. And he was he, essentially, just to give you an example, when we finally did raid the facility, which was seven months after we entered it, but we had tried to get the facility addressed by authorities for five months and finally succeeded in December of 2009, in the garage of the facility, which was very, very cold, there were boxes upon boxes of iguanas, 200 or so iguanas, who had been packed for a shipment to Egypt that never went out because the Egypt, uh, the buyer never paid. And so these animals uh, sat in boxes with no food, water, humidity, or heat for two weeks. And when we arrived at the facility with a team of experts uh, and they unpacked those boxes, most of those animals were dead. But the ones who had survived, uh, not all of them, you, you know, some, m most of them were dead when we arrived and some of them didn't make it, even though we did our best. But that just gives you an example of, of the m horrific uh, neglect. There was no food at the facility. There was a rotten head of lettuce. There were uh, reptiles, um, meaning snakes and turtles and lizards, and there were scorpions and spiders and sloths and hamsters and hedgehogs and chinchillas. I mean, he just, you know, dealt in anything and everything that he could make a penny on with just absolutely no decency whatsoever. So it was a huge victory. Um, it was a massive player in the international pet trade, and he was charged with smuggling, uh, conspiracy, and fraud because of the, uh, just the, he essentially, obviously was smuggling, but also um, was uh, faking health certificates before shipping these animals out of the country. And th those animals came in and out of virtually every continent. Uh, you know, wild caught, you know, in South America, for example, for the sloths. And they would come in in these tiny boxes with n nothing, um, mm. just completely traumatized and then shoved into some other enclosure until they were sold to some buyer who, you know, who knows what, what prompts people to buy animals like that. But it was a, a massive victory and a very, very hard fought battle for these animals. Now, you shut down the facility practically overnight. The operator, though, is he's a federal fugitive, still still at large. But what happened to the animals? What, what were you able to do with the animals that he was dealing with? So the animals were seized by the SPCA of Texas, along with the city of Arlington. And because of the legal uh, pr process, uh, the, the, the tr it wasn't quite a trial, but the court proceeding. Um, it took about 60 days before the animals were able to be dispersed, but they were dispersed to various groups. Um, for example, there were 600 hedgehogs at the facility that we set up a big, big rescue facility at the SBC of Texas. And, and someone wanted 600 hedgehogs? I mean, you were able to place 600? Believe it or not, there are, there are groups that specialize in hedgehog rescue and placement. And the hedgehogs really stick in my mind because these groups came to Texas. And, and some of them are, I mean, they really sent volunteers who just helped with the setup, helped the expert with the setup, and they are so devoted to hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. um, and they did, they came through and they ended up placing all of these hedgehogs. And this was just, it, it was wonderful for those animals who were rescued. Of course, the victory was also for the animals who would never be victimized by the pet trade. But it was also a very, very vital educational experience for people who are, say, passionate about hedgehogs, who are exotic. And, they, you know, these are folks who just had no idea, uh, you know, where they never gave a thought to where these animals came from. I mean, they just didn't think about they it. They were just blinded by Sonic the Hedgehog or something. And 
And, uh, the, <laughs> Who wouldn't be? And the thing is, uh, hedgehogs have rights. And that's one of the things, one of the positive outcomes of the U.S. Global Exotics uh, case. But you have had, had other victories, like uh, Global Captive Breeders is another company that you investigated. And that was another huge victory for you with uh, uh, reptiles and 16,000 rats. I mean, uh, tell us about the yeah. Global Captive Breeders case, because that's got to be right up there as one of your greatest hits. It is. You know, when, when, of course, the victories are always so, so sweet for the animals who are liberated from these hell holes. Uh, but, you know, from a, you know, personally, when you, when you have to fight for something so hard and you know it's the right thing and you've been up, you know, night after night strategizing and devising and cajoling authorities and offering help and fundraising to offer resources, the, the victory is so meaningful because it's, it, it, it's really just, it's justice, mm -hmm. you know, it's just justice unfolding, you know, and um, Global Captive Breeders was, a facility in Lake Elsinore, California. It did house between uh, about 16,000 um, rats who were mostly being bred to be uh, food, to be used as food for snakes. And the, the, um, the facility had two parts. And one part was a sort of warehouse for these rodents, and the other part was where the snakes were being housed. Um, both parts were just, both sections of the facility were absolutely filthy and reeked of infection and death. And that was really the same thing with U.S. Global Exotics is the absolutely overpowering stench of death and infection and just disease when you walk in the door of these places. Um, but Lake Elsinore authorities were quite resistant. Um, we, did, we did have a good humane society on the ground, thankfully, who wanted to do the, a, a good job and the right thing. And what we found with that case, as well as the U.S. Global Exotics case, is that even when you have individuals within a law enforcement agency or a humane society who want to do the right thing, oftentimes they are completely paralyzed by their sheer mm. lack of knowledge about these exotic animals. This was particularly evident in Texas. And so you know, part of what we offer when we go into these situations is expert advice, an expert team, people that we bring in from sometimes in the same state, sometimes out of state, sometimes out of the country, people who can walk into a facility like that and know what they're looking at. And, and that was key in both cases. With the Lake Elsinore case, we were able to get a, a a warrant executed at the mm -hmm. facility, and then the animals were eventually seized. And it was, and and in fact, the owner of the facility and the manager of the facility were both charged with uh, nearly a hundred felony cruelty to animal charges each. They eventually pled down and all of that, but in the end, really, not only were cruelty charges filed and they pled, but uh, they and had to pay PETA back for every cent. <laughs> we spent on the case, which was nice, but also the animals came out and they shut down. And so that, again, you know, that's a, that's a player that goes out and it's, it's a, it's a warning, you know, it's a, it's a wake up call for the industries that abuse animals in this way to know we're here and we're watching you. And if, if, if we come after you, you're going down. Well, it was the largest seizure of rats in U.S. history, the largest ever seizure of animals in California. So that was really quite a quite an investigation on on behalf of your department. Uh, you also have done some looking into, uh, say, other other corporate uh, places. I mean, th those were kind of uh, I don't want to say they're storage facilities as they they transported animals, but I guess that's what they were. But you also went into labs, uh, like at the Professional Laboratory and Research Services. Uh, PLRS in uh, North Carolina. And this is kind of a warning for, for laboratories too when, when PETA goes into investigations into those kind of sites. Absolutely. That was a, a, a horrible place, something from medieval times. So, so you also go into labs, is my point, not just these storage facilities as animals are transported, 
but in laboratories where people should know better. Yes, they should know better everywhere, really. But yes, I take your point. Uh, Professional Laboratory Research Services was in Corapik, North Carolina. It was something from the medieval times. Just really something you wouldn't dream existed. Um, It held uh, hundreds of dogs, cats, and rabbits for experiments. And it 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 not only were, not only were the conditions for the individual animals deplorable but the staff at this lab they, they were so mean they were vicious with these animals and we were able to capture video of these workers yelling spraying abusing uh these animals specifically i recall a cat who was being, uh, I, I think that they were trying to trim his nails or something, or they they were trying to restrain him in some way that he didn't appreciate. Um, and the woman who was holding him would put his paw around this chain link so that his claws would be wrapped around the metal. Mm. And then she would forcefully pull on his leg in order to hurt him on purpose. Uh, and just... Horrible, vicious people. And we did shut that down very shortly after we published the case and the animals were released um, to actually our area shelters here because this particular facility was not too far from where we're based in Virginia, although the facility was in North Carolina. And um, it was extremely gratifying to shut that place down. And and that, again, was a wake-up call to the industry that does tests on animals for flea and tick medication, for example. Um, and you know, these are, this was a facility that was forcing, subjecting rabbits to having basically ticks feed on them, um, to, to, they were breeding the ticks in order to assess the effectiveness of whatever they were testing. Um, so it, it's most, it had no use whatsoever and was, it was contracting with major corporations. So it's nice that that's, a relic at the moment. <laughs> well, you were able to close down that lab, but you also got a grand jury to indict four workers. It was the first time. Yeah, and it was the first time that that had ever happened. So now, what does that say to people who may want to work at labs and and may see these kind of things? I guess they should all be whistleblowers, huh? No, I hope so. I, you know, I, I hope people know that they should blow their whistle when they see something wrong. Uh, and most definitely, it is a wake-up call to the industry and the people who work in it that PETA is watching. And you never know who within you is watching because people do call us. The PLRS case was a whistleblower call. The Lake Elsinore, the captive the global captive breeders, that was also a whistleblower call. So it is, it is very meaningful when people see something for them to say something and to never be silent to speak up because the animals can't do that and when you see something that's wrong and you know that it's wrong all you have to do is make a phone call so we're talking about places where animals are stored places like in other places like laboratories but you also went to uh, the factory farms the the food factories uh, specifically uh, the pig factory farm that's run by or that supplies Hor- Hor- Hormel. And uh, tell us about that investigation, because I think people still are, you know, if they haven't gone vegan or gone vegetarian, uh, then they may still eat meat. They need to know what's going on and how the food is being processed at, at some of these uh factory farms. So tell us about the Hormel case or the the supplier to Hormel and and what you found when uh, you went to Iowa um, to to look at a pig factory farm. Yeah, we we investigated a a pig factory farm and I believe it was Greene County, Iowa. This was in 2008 or so. And um, this was a pig farm that had, you know, most most of the farms that we look at that house pigs have um, a farrowing side and then a, a, a you know a side where they basically have the pigs and then the side where they have the pigs who are pr- pregnant um, and so we ended up having uh, uh, an, an observer and eyewitness work on each side 
which allowed us to really see not just both, you know, aspects of the operation, but where the abuse takes place, you know, systematically is when these uh, these poor salves are being forced to move from one side to the other. And, you know, if you can imagine, I mean, these are these are animals who don't move very much because they're in tiny little cages all the time. And so when they are moved into the farrowing side, which is where they are, again, in cages, farrowing crates or gestation crates, um, and they really cannot move, um, they, you know, these are animals whose muscles have atrophied, who have been who have been bred and raised to be heavier than they should be, uh, because the companies want to make money off of their meat per the per pound, and so they're afraid. They're afraid of the the men who work there who don't show them kindness. They're sore and their their muscles are atrophied and they don't move quickly, and so the men get very frustrated with them, which is what we showed in our investigation. Is that um, these poor sows were beaten uh, and abused, including sexually, when we were at this facility. Um, and we also documented, you know, other things. We documented very poor methods of killing piglets who are, um, the, the industry essentially disposes of piglets who don't make a certain weight by three weeks of age. And the manner in which the industry allows these farms to dispose of them is to thump them essentially killing them by blunt force trauma, which means someone has to take this tiny piglet who's, you know, maybe the size of a football and grab them by the hind legs and just with all your might slam their head against the floor. And the man who was tasked with this, you know, grim task was very half-hearted about it, which meant that these animals survived the thumping. And he would put them all in a bucket and just leave them there to die. Hmm. And so one of the things that our eyewitness documented is this bucket of, you know, dying piglets struggling to breathe and survive one on top of another. Um, and that was, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. And these are typical abuses in the factory farming industry. So if, you know, if one hasn't gone vegan yet, you know, PETA.org will be a huge help. <laughs> Well, you said you said something that was that kind of struck me. You said there was also sexual abuse of the pigs by the workers. There was there was sexual abuse of the by the workers. Yes, and this is not necessarily you know this was not an isolated incident. We have in every investigation that we've done, there's always sort of like bizarre mm -hmm. sexual innuendos and just strange behavior on part of the workers. But um, there were descriptions of by workers of workers penetrating sows with crowbars and things like that. So it's, you know, obviously, you know, totally appalling. I mean, the entire operation is, is, is something out of a horror movie. I mean, you've got, you know, when we say factory farm, we don't mean, you know, a dozen or a hundred pigs. It's a, it's a massive, massive warehouse that contains 6,000 plus pigs. Um, and, y you know, I mean, it's just, it is literally a factory farm. And these animals are seen as nothing but uh, meat production. And so I guess if someone witnessed the sexual harassment of a sow, I guess you don't go to HR. You just hope there's a Peter, Peter undercover person there Machine. documenting it so that uh, you could stop it. I mean, the... The grand jury, um, I understand, or actually, there were six workers that admitted guilt uh, in that whole case, and it was the first convictions, first convictions of their kind in in Iowa. So that's right, and Iowa is the top top pig producing state in the nation, and this was, I believe it or not, because this is actually this was um, this was the first investigation I supervised when I took over undercover investigations. So it's. It's a vivid, a very vivid and, um, you know, a significant memory for me. And I flew to Iowa to meet with the sheriff's office, and I was joined by someone from the Animal Rescue League in Des Moines, which is a, a wonderful outfit. And um, the sheriff's deputy whom I met with, who has since retired, had grown up on a pig farm, and he was appalled. He was appalled by the footage I showed him and the photos I showed him. 
And, um, you know, it was, it was significant to have these people charged. It was significant that they pled guilty. And it was significant that this happened in Iowa. And this was a real, the, in, the, the industry itself published a piece in one of their uh, publications that said, you know, this is a wake-up call. This is a wake-up call for our industry. Um, so it, it, it was extremely significant for a number of reasons. Well, it, that was in 2008. What kind of wake-up call has it been? Or have people fallen back asleep? Well, I mean, there's so much more waking up to do, right? I mean, it, it just... I, I, these factory farms and these slaughterhouses are going to continue to exist until people stop eating animals. And it's really that simple. So it's up to the consumer to make a difference in that way. PETA is here and PETA is always going to be watching people abuse, who abuse animals and shine a spotlight on that. But the bottom line is that if people are concerned about animals who, uh, who are um, factory farmed, and slaughtered for their flesh or used, you know, for dairy or egg laying hens, the most, the most basic and easiest thing to do is to go vegan because there is no humane way for these animals to be farmed like this. And it doesn't matter what claims the companies are making, and they are making some pretty rich claims. You know, the bottom line is that stop thinking about your palate. Dafta Nekminovich, Senior Vice President and Head of PETA's Cruelty Investigations, on how PETA and whistleblowers like you have stopped wholesale supply operations, laboratories, and even factory farms. Although there's still much more to be done. And as Dafta said, thinking about going vegan may be the loudest whistle you can blow to halt the meat production of factory farming. For information on becoming vegan and information about taking action in general, go to PETA.org. Contact me on Twitter at Emil Amuck. Once again, thank you for listening. Go to our podcast player, fill out the survey. It's uh, feedback that will help us grow the show. And don't forget to share a link with friends and let them know there's a voice for the animals on the PETA podcast. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.